Hello and welcome. I'm Patrick Curtis, your host and chief monkey, and this is the Wall Street Oasis podcast. Join me as I talk to some of the community's most successful and inspirational members to gain valuable insight into different career paths and life in general. Let's get to it. In this episode, we continue my talk with Prop Set about his progression as an investor at a top hedge fund. Learn what is expected of you when you first start, how you can grow, and listen to one of the trades that changed everything. Enjoy. Tell me about like, do you feel like you were a natural, uh, natural investor? Was equity always long, short, kind of a natural fit for you? Do you feel like people have different, you know, some, there's, you know, very f- famous short sellers that just have natural, you know, a tendency to like dig and look for just, you know, crap happening um, in these firms. So what's, what's, what did you feel like for yourself and for other people? I, you know, it's the funniest thing. I don't know if it's just, um, being like a, a mild worry wart about things or just in consulting, getting kind of dropped into all these different kinds of firms that had all these different kinds of problems. But I really felt like I was seeing how things could go off the rails operationally and how you wouldn't even see it show up as like a hole in numbers for like a couple of months. And I was like, that's very interesting because that means you can see kind of things going wrong here and then that's going to spell trouble down the line. But by the way, the whole way to when you're, you know, walking the, when whatever management is walking the company off a cliff, they're telling you how great everything is. So they are never going to say, Hey, you know, um, I know you like our company, but I should probably tell you things are deteriorating at an accelerating pace. And, um, (laughs) you know, uh, unless you want to cancel Christmas this year, you should uh, really just short this company as much as you, as much as the market will bear, uh, that you'll thank me later. You know, management (laughs) doesn't say that. Um, and so you have to, you know, you have to put on your thinking cap, Uh, you you know, you have to evaluate the claims. And, uh, you know, I know that there's a lot to do. And there are a lot of models to update and a lot of things to keep track of. And it's enough to just even get the numbers right for the numbers that were reported. You know, I I understand that that all is, uh, is that but that's already kind of all in the stock, what you have to do next is see, you know, do I have like a real differentiation? And I was thinking about that just um, when, when people first start out pitching stocks, I mean, how long have I done this? And I don't know what words like surge or plummet mean. Tell me, you know, what percent, you know, the stock is up, how much stock is down, how much? And then I'll, you know, I'll decide if it's surge, plummet, spike, drop, you know, what all the things people say. Um, and so, and that's actually another thing. At the end of the day, like the stock has to go somewhere. And, you know, in your pitch, you need to say, okay, the price is going to go to, you know, X, Y, Z. Is that because the multiple moves or is that because something moves in the numbers uh, and just understanding where, like, how is it supposed to get from price A to price B? Is it just, you know, earnings don't go anywhere and just people pay up more for the company for some reason? And yeah. there are reasons people do that, like take out speculation or what have you. Yeah. Uh, but understanding that is important. And so for, for me, do I feel like I was a natural? Um, with short selling, it's kind of a funny thing. I just... Uh, Almost all the alpha I've generated on the buy side has been on the short side. Mm-hmm. And um, that doesn't surprise me from just talking to you because you seem like you're very meticulous. And so like you need to be kind of like see those little details in the earnings that are earnings reports that are changing slightly that maybe, like you said, is a canary in the coal mine. Well, it's, it's just one of those things because you could argue, you know, you could say, well, fine, if all of your alpha has come from your shorts, you could have doubled your alpha by shorting your longs, since apparently there hasn't been much alpha in those. Um, you know, it's, it's just one of these funny things. You just kind of have to know where you tend to do better, and you have to learn how to make a case. I do think that, um, you know, short selling is a very interesting crucible, uh, because there are just so many people who want stocks to go up. I mean, you know, the, the management wants the stock to go up. The investors want the stock to go up. The people who own the ETFs that own the stock want it to go up. Like you're really, um, you really better have your ducks in a row if you're trying to short anything. Um, because um, in and you know we'll see what happens in kind of this uh, in this rates environment. What kind of happens? Yeah, um, very interesting time right now. We're, we're, by the way, this is being recorded Jan January eighteenth, twenty twenty two. So we're kind of yeah. So. Here we are. My my the only thing uh, that I can share is 
I would have thought that rates would have gone up earlier. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I thought the 10-year yield was going to be at two by the end of 22, when, or by the end of 21, when we were in like June of 21. Um, didn't happen. You know, things, uh, things, things show up when they show up, not when you hope that they will show up. So, uh, you know, you kind of have to be prepared um, for that. But yeah, I mean, so learning kind of what kind of investor you are, that's actually an important thing. And it's it's strange to say, understand who you are in terms of investment style, because people say, I'm not even, I don't even have an unpaid internship on the buy side, and I'm supposed to understand who I am. And it goes back to the same, you know, problem. But here's something you can do that doesn't require working somewhere to understand a little bit about what kind of investments stand out to you. There are all these books out there where they have interviews with investors, you know, hedge fund market wizards, where the guy interviews a whole number of different uh, stars in the hedge fund world. And you can see, you know, is did one of those people say something that kind of resonated more with you uh, than the other ones? And all you had to do was read a book. Like you didn't have to, uh, you know, get on, you know, LinkedIn and, you know, worry that they didn't respond because you proposed tea instead of coffee. Like you can just read a book. Um, and when you see those things, I know it sounds so open-ended and subjective and, you, you know, a little, um, a little bit out there, but Really, understanding how you invest has meaningful practical implications, both with re regard to where you apply and work, as well as what sorts of ideas you pitch to your PM and yeah. how likely it is that your PM is going to put that position in the book. You know, if your PM is investor type X and you are investor type Y, and for some reason those styles are not complementary or compatible, uh, probably you're going to part ways sooner rather than later. So tell me about, so let's, let's go back to your story. This. So you, you get this internship. Mm -hmm. Um, at this large fund and you know, you're kind of just like no experience you're coming in suddenly you're having to initiate some coverage and mm -hmm. tell me what that transition was like for you was it easy was it something where you just working crazy hours or what I I was rather accustomed to working crazy hours so that that for me was never I never I know that sometimes people come from very grueling jobs to the buy side and they say ah at last I can stretch my feet out I can go get brunch I'm not like a brunch person, you know, if people want to do coffee chats, I do a phone call. Uh, I'm not, I, I just, I, I don't know where people find the time that way. Um, so I wasn't, I wasn't um, opposed to working hours. And I said, you know, this is your shot. It's so like, think of all the things that had to fall into place just to sit in this seat. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not sitting in the seat to feel like, you know, to see what sitting in a seat feels like, like I got to do something. I need to, you know, demonstrate some value. All the things that I wrote about in my cover letter that I hope to learn all this, all that, you know, th this is it, you know, the, the clock is on, the race is happening right now. And so um, what I did as best as I could was prepare work products to the satisfaction of my PM. I would check in frequently. Um, and what does that mean? Check in frequently, like once a week, you're bothering him. What? Um, here's what I did. I mean, during, during, I would say when the market's open, unless it's very important, don't bug your PM because probably the question that you have is going to be a costly question because of the attention that it diverts away from the market, and you know could easily uh, wipe out your pay. You know, with with one tick. Like, so um, it's not to say that it's unimportant that you're working at the fund. It's just to say, know the right times to approach your PM. Um, and so what we did was in the morning before anything really happened, we'd say, okay, you know, here's, here's what's laid out for the day. You know, here's, here's what we're working on. And then at the end of the day, uh, you know, after the close, we, we'd check and I'd say, okay, here's where I got, here's what I got lined up next for this evening. And then I'll send you a thing at the end of the night. Um, and so just, I would, we had kind of a like what would that what give me an example like when you say thing when you say thing so like what does that even mean like an analysis on an industry like a coverage but so, so when things started um my pm was picking up a, an industry uh that was new so it wasn't just i have all the answers and you're going to learn the answers we were learning this together yeah so it almost echoed what i did for the very first uh internship in in that fall where I had to look at the landscape, understand kind of the lay of the land, the different players. And so this is easy in public markets because unlike private markets where you can go out and knock on every single door, there are only so many listed companies. So these are the ways that you can express a view on an industry. And so we said, all right, we're gonna do a ticker a week over the course of this internship. And so each company, I did what they do, what they're, you know, what is actually meant by the revenue items. Cause some companies will be like, 
you know, sales, but some will do gross sales, some will do net sales. So you just have to really understand what's going on. And so I put that together and then I read through the old earnings calls to try to understand what was important. Um, I, think, I think people will find that most stocks trade at any given time on like one or two fundamental inputs from that company. Yeah. Like sometimes the debate will be price, sometimes it'll be volume, you know, you know, in simple terms. But one of those things is going to matter a bunch. Uh, and then, you know, maybe, maybe next week it changes and it's some new thing. But just generally speaking, the best thing you can do is just understand kind of what music is playing. Like, oh, it's the volume matters music. Okay, so any news I see about volume, I should weight more heavily than news about price these days, that kind of a thing. Right. Uh, and so I would have kind of this skeleton framework coming together during the week. And then by call it Thursday or Friday, we'd sit down and go through it. And uh, I'd have like a skeleton model. Um, I probably got it from the sell side or something, but just for for expedient, for, you know, for the sake of expediency, that'll do just fine. Mm -hmm. um, and you say, okay, here's kind of how it's laid out. You know, here's kind of the growth algorithm. They grow top line, this kind of rate. They grow EPS, that kind of rate. Here's the valuation. Here's where it is relative to peers. Here's why I think it trades at a premium to peers or a discount to peers. Like either they got some juicy contract that they've been locked into for like 10 years that others can't achieve, or maybe they, uh, they have superior management, and so their cost control is second to none. So they're always going to have the best operating leverage, it's just those kinds of things. But this would be the kinds of things that I would um, send. And this was where I was beginning to fuse together the things that I was learning in business school uh, with kind of the work product that was required. And, uh, and I managed to do it without slides, and I managed to do it without translating, you know, all, all the stuff that, uh, that I was accustomed to. I said, you know, those were things that I did do. They helped me get in the door. But now what's going to move the needle is what I do on this side of the door. And, um, you, you know, for anybody who is glum about their PM, not really recognizing what they used to do in their past life, uh, why hold such high hopes that someone who hasn't done this thing that you've done is going to be able to fully appreciate in the same way you do the thing that you did? Just it's a big ask. So it sounds like you did really well. Uh, I got asked back. And uh, yeah. actually, I was uh, knocking on the door beginning in January because I thought, well, why don't I just resume doing an in-semester internship again? And so I, I took a break in the fall, and then I actually scooped another internship uh, during the fall. And I should point out, some of these internships, the reason I got one internship that I did was because I was the first guy to reply to the email. That was it. Uh, just the, the guy emailed back and said, you were the very first one to reply to the email. So I guess it's yours. And so sometimes that's how it goes. Uh, and so I, I did some other stuff and I think it was good. One way that I made a, you know, a great use of the time during business school was to just interact with so many different investment styles because it gave me a mental framework being out and about in the real markets later on to understand, oh, you know, would this boss have bought that or sold that? Would that boss have bought that or sold that? Would they have stayed away entirely? Why would they do that? And just the more kind of personalities you come into contact with, the more you can imagine what they would do. So, you know, I'm not going to call it like my investing Mount Rushmore or anything like that, but it's just kind of my kind of my bag of memories that I can draw from when I think about, oh, what would so-and-so do in this situation? What would they say? Would they be buying it? at the top and saying, oh, you know, it only looks expensive uh, or right. are, are they gonna try and short it? Just all those kinds of things. Um, so I, I resumed working in, um, in January coming into spring semester of business school. How are you doing classes and working? How many hours are you putting at the, at the hedge fund and how many hours at school? This is another one of those things that I can say now and it, it's not as alarming. I had a spreadsheet of, and I, I think I called it like the number, and I had done well enough in business school that uh, graduating wasn't really in jeopardy on condition that I completed my requisite credits. So I did like, sometimes they'll have a, you know, a week where you can get, you can pick up a few credits. And so, you know, you do just this one week where it's like nine to five, and then you get three credits just like that. So then that frees up a little bit of time during, you know, the real semester. So it was like, okay, you know, you sprint a little bit here and then you can stretch out and work a little bit during this time. So I was doing that, but then also I thought, okay, why don't I just do some of these like seminar classes that meet like a few times? And I said, you know, I think that after graduation, the only interaction that the business school is going to have with me is um, asking for donations. Right. And so uh, moreover, the, I understand that the school is very focused 
on making sure that everybody is employed after graduating. There is a very important distinction between a job and the job. They will help you get a job and they're very good at it. But if you wanna get the job, uh, you have to take some personal ownership of kind of where you land. Yeah. And so uh, I said, well, you know, I don't mean to sound very, um, you know, grim, but it is very hard for a business school to sell an empty second year seat on the open market. You know, they can't just stand on the corner and say, get your second empty second year seats here. They can't do that. So they'll find a way to make sure that you pay and graduate because the graduation statistics also matter. So anyway, back to this number spreadsheet. Yeah. I, as I completed these classes, I said, okay, well, you know, I've done these and I've gotten these grades. So here's how bad it would have to be in my remaining classes to, so that I couldn't graduate. And so as long as I just got over those bars, I said, you know what? I so far have not found any hedge fund that was so preoccupied with my graduate school grades. They look at undergrad GPA, good enough. Um, and then they just want to know that you do the work. So I thought, okay, I just need to graduate. And then this just becomes like a, you know, a, 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 what should I even say? A, a matter of logistics of, oh, graduation is this day? Okay, so you can, you can start on that day, you know, that kind of thing. Right. Of course, it wasn't that easy because I went on the graduation trip and this was, the graduation trip was to kind of a, you know, a very hot place in the Caribbean. But I think I was sweating maybe three times as much as everybody else because I still didn't have a job lined up because kind of the wheels were turning inside and graduation was coming and, you know, I, it's not my first rodeo of graduating from an edu from a secondary program and not having a job, you know, I'll get through it. But um, yeah. I was worried about that. But then at the end, um, you know what the final tell was? This is actually kind of funny. Uh, my Bloomberg stopped working. And so I called Bloomberg and I said, you know, oh, uh, heavens me, what has happened? My Bloomberg <laughs> stopped working. And the account manager said, the account has been terminated. But not there's there are different kinds of terminated, and this is the kind of terminated that usually happens when somebody is being converted from an intern to a full time employee. Oh, good. So you know that's not the same thing as an offer letter, but that's like that's basically how you found out you had the job. That's kind of how I found out. Uh, and so, uh, but you know, you don't want to walk. Around, I mean, what can you even say? You can't walk around and say, "Oh, I've got an offer." Well, why do you have an offer? Oh, the account manager from Bloomberg told me that my account was terminated, but it wasn't a regular term. You know, nobody wants to hear that. They want to hear offer. Right. So, but that, that was kind of a, a hint. And so I went back to sweating to a much more modest, two times as much as everybody else after yeah. that phone call. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So you ended up uh, working there for a good number of years. Tell me a little bit about, obviously the pay was probably even better than, than what you're making at the consulting firm. That, that is a fair characterization. This was a worthwhile trade. Yes. <laughs> and do you mind sharing a range or anything like that? Or, or um, yes, 300 to 500? Or... You know, uh, the, the, the numbers that you're describing are not uh, outlandish, let's say, but because, uh, I, you know, I'd rather just respect anonymity and- That's fine. Know. That's fine. Yeah, I would, yeah I would never ask for exact numbers, just, just getting a range. But no, I understand if it's it's- sensitive. It's, it's well, what I can say is um, in, in the hedge fund world, the cone of outcomes is widened substantially. As in, some people say, oh, you know, in my worst year, I'll probably make X. Well, it's a little different in the hedge fund industry because in your worst year, you don't finish the year. Um, <laughs> that's, so they fire you. Yeah, I think that I think that's an important distinction uh, between that and other jobs. But yeah, um, yeah you can make 300% of your base or 500% of your base in a crazy year, an amazing year, but you can also lose your job. You can also familiarize yourself with COBRA insurance. Yeah. Uh, you know, well, so those are the kinds of things that can happen. But, sure. uh, you know, it's, it's one of these things, you know, for the love of the game, just uh, you always want to have exposure uh, to, to upside. And there's, there is just the thrill of uh, investing. Sure. And so tell me a little bit about like how things progress. So you'd already kind of been working with the fund for a while, through the internship. So it kind of probably felt really natural. Um, you were working through the semester, through business school, kind of just trying to get through business school. You graduate, you finally get, you finally eventually assume officially here that you have the job. Um, I, I do, I do uh, have the job and I, you know, I have a diploma too. So uh, you start I working right away, right after you come back from the trip. Um, I think it was very quick. I, I'm trying to remember, you know, I know people have stories like graduated on Friday, started on Monday. You know, I don't remember the specifics, but I did not have time off yeah. uh, in between. 
And, yeah. and I, I didn't want it, frankly. I mean, I wanted to kind of get in the game. You're ready to go. Yeah. So tell me, were you working 70 hour weeks, 60 hour weeks? Was it, or were you pushing yourself harder? Because it, it seems like with Hedrons, you could never, you could work 120 hours a week if you wanted to. There's always more research to do. There's always more stuff. It, it's a wise thing that you share. Um, I, I kind of, you know, I, I might even say I lived in the office a little bit uh, just because I was so focused on getting everything just right. And I, I, and this was kind of part of my progression and uh, evolution. I, I was very focused on getting these little details right, which is part of the picture, but you don't want to do that to the exclusion of the rest of the picture. And it kind of goes back to, you know, thinking back to the investment committee of the PE fund. I guarantee you they're not thinking about like, oh, is that 40 bips? Is that probably the right? That, that's not what they're thinking. Uh, they're taking a step back and saying, you know, is this an attractive opportunity? Is there a secular tailwind? Uh, is it cheap? Those kinds of things. Right. And so at the beginning, I was just making sure, and by the way, this is a normal thing that happens with new analysts. Maybe one of the first things you do is you're creating capacity for your PM. So all the models are up to date, like you, you know, you note in them what the company guidance was, you have maybe a cover sheet and you have some kind of a framework. And that's kind of where, where you start things out. But um, you're not, you're not kind of, uh, you're not paying for yourself by just keeping the models tight. They can always pull one down from a sell side website. So you have to go beyond that. And so how do you go beyond that? Your next evolution is going to be when you can start pitching ideas that generate real P and L. And there was a, a period where I, I turned the corner uh, and, and I, I went from just like, you know, guy who uh, updates models to somebody who's really pitching meaningful ideas. And there was a company in my coverage where the, the company was a turnaround story. And just there was a lot of blocking and tackling that had been neglected forever. And they brought in new management and they were a couple years in and they were starting to see some positive signs show up in the metrics. But then out of nowhere, they go and buy this company that's in another, that's on another continent. There is no connection between other than incidentally doing the same types of things there, there's no connection, no synergy, no nothing. And so to me, it struck me as odd because here they were saying, you know, we were doing all this blocking and tackling and that was so great. Yeah. And then there was this uh, unexplained departure from that strategy. Massive and I, acquisition. I, I, I sensed kind of, you know, either a cleave in management uh, and maybe some debate about that. And I thought, you know, I need to get on the phone and, and talk to the company. So. Um, an important thing as an analyst is that you, um, you know, you, you always keep a good relationship with companies. So I was on the phone with IR and I said, you know, I can't help but notice. I mean, we've seen all this continued progress. I guess why take your eye off the ball of the blocking and tackling now? Just this is when the rubber's really going to hit the road. And the response was, and, you know, I'm not going to quote it verbatim or anything, but it was just, uh, you know, I see the point that you're making, but uh, you can't control when good things come up for sale on the market. And if we had waited to complete all of the blocking and tackling, who's to say it would have still been around to buy by the time we finished that. So this is, you know, maybe we're going to take our foot off the gas a little bit, but we're also going to be integrating this other one. And so to me, I just thought, I don't think everybody's ready for how big of a shock this is going to be that just they have to take their foot off the gas from the thing that everyone was buying the stock for. Well, uh, a scant number of weeks later, the company has um, kind of, uh, shall we say, a negative pre-announcement, and they reaffirmed guidance where the bulls had been playing for the company to raise guidance. And so they just said, yeah, it's going to be kind of what you thought it was. And so the bulls, you know, nothing left to play for there. And then there were some unexpected liabilities that cropped up from something that had happened like 15 years ago under prior management. But this is one of these companies where just these liabilities don't just evaporate on their own like yeah. they need to be they need to be dealt with and uh i said you know so we had been positioned short coming into it and then the announcement hits and the stock is already down like i think first tick it was down like 10 percent uh so you know the, yeah. now we're talking and uh, i think when when the dust finally settled uh I, I think maybe on the day you know i'd have to go back and look but it was down like you know mid high teens percent on the day and then Later on, when I when I got on the phone with the company, kind of after they had their you know earnings call and stuff like that, um, the I'm trying to think if this it was either this someone was so telling me about a call, hearing this someone, someone, someone was telling me about this call, or maybe I was on the call. But they said, oh, you know, before we kick things off, I just want you to know that we uh, we also have our retained counsel uh, on the line as well. And so I thought, you know, 
having your retained counsel on the line during a call with investors doesn't sound like regular dude things. This sounds like uh, something that happens in unusual circumstances. And so I thought, whatever it is, it actually is worse because they can only articulate to the investing public what has been approved and likely uh, settled or identified. So they can ring fence that, but it would not at all be in their interest to state more than that number because of matters that were pending and not yet settled. This would give kind of a bogey for the plaintiff side to chase. And so they cannot give you a single number on that because to do so would be to cede advantage to right. opposing counsel. So, I, you know, I thought about that a little bit and uh, I thought, you know, this thing, this thing's like a huge short. Anyway, long story short, the, um, the stock got like cut in half in like two weeks. Uh, and, you know, it wasn't even one of these uh, SaaS stocks in a rising rate environment. This was a real, you know, fundamental uh, thing that uh, kind of cut it in half. And so, that was uh, where I think I'd really turned the corner and it was like, oh, you know, this is actually like, he came up with that idea, he chased it down, he did the research, he articulated kind of what was uneasy. And then uh, because I kind of had like, you know, I'm not just uh, sitting in the office doing nothing all the time, you know, you gotta, gotta work sooner or later. I had kind of a grid of what bulls and bears play for along different time horizons. Yeah. And I thought, wow, the longest owners of this stock are going to be completely blindsided by um, by the turnaround being put on pause. Right. And I could not possibly have anticipated these uh, unexpected legal liabilities. It, it was simply not even something I thought about. Yeah. I, I already thought taking, taking the foot off the gas with the turnaround that was going very well was yeah. already enough cause for concern, but that was that. So why did I, why did we go on this whole segue? It was to say that when you first start out, you're going to just be getting numbers in the models. You're going to make sure that your PM has enough to work with and you know things are up to date so that they can kind of tinker around in the model and flex different scenarios. And then as you get to know your companies, that's when you start to evolve to an analyst who can generate P&L and start pitching ideas that generate real, real dollars. Um, and... That's actually another important uh, skill. I, you know, I, I know I said like remove words like surge and plummet from your vocabulary, but you also need to be able to pitch it in 30 seconds or less. And like, even though it's your boss who brought you on and kind of took you under their wing, time is still finite. So you need to be able to just get out the headlines, boom, 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 right. uh, and not just kind of reason it out while your PM is listening. Like you need to have it ready to go. Um, and actually there's another thing that I'd point out there, which is, um, you shouldn't be afraid to stick your neck out when you articulate a view. I mean, it's unlikely that, you know, half the stocks in your coverage are going to get cut in half during the next earnings season, but, you know, probably doesn't, probably not happening. Could, but probably not. But you need to, you know, you shouldn't be afraid to be bold. Uh, and the reason why is when you articulate your view, you're helping other people see what you're playing for. And also by being, by articulating your thesis, they can understand how they should respond to new developments. So if you say this stock has eroding pricing power and when the market figures that out, the stock is going, yeah, people are going to have to cut their earnings numbers by 10% and the stock probably loses some multiples. So we're playing for like 15% downside here. Well, now that that kind of toothpaste is out of the tube, your PM is going to say, oh, so when I see news about cutting price, that really means something for this stock. Or in talking with the company, right. You know the game that's being played, like you, like you said. Yeah, it, you, you know what song is playing. So the volume yeah. stuff, you can kind of, you know, it, it, it's of some informational value, but not, not super informational value at that time. Later yeah. on, watch, it'll be the volume thing. And then you have to go back through all your, you know, the volume stuff. So that's, uh, but, but you have to be okay to stick your neck out because fundamentally, this is a game about taking risks. And it goes back to what I was saying about the way you are rewarded is by breaking consensus, not by following it or by building it. Um, just you... Either, either everything is priced perfectly right now and so shall be forever in perpetuity, or new information is going to come out that is going to change what people think it is worth paying for a share of XYZ company stock on any given day. And maybe it's a long and it goes up, maybe it's a short and it goes down. But your, your, your fundamental premise is the stock is overvalued or undervalued, and here's why. Yeah. Um, and here's the work I've done. And uh, people will sit up in their seat 
when. And it could be, you know, the company is going to go talk at conferences or mm -hmm. uh, there's going to be earnings or something like that. And so you, you, you want to have this kind of catalyst path um, that you should always have that in mind when you're pitching things, because right. that's how you know when you're wrong. Otherwise, it's like two people arguing about who would have won a rained out baseball game. It's just a totally pointless discussion, waste of time Like you could be working on anything else. So, um, yeah, that's uh, that, that's a little bit about the uh, analyst uh, progression and kind of how you go to generating PNL and then. You know, when you when you're looking at, you know, should should it come to pass that you're looking at other places, they're going to start asking you like, hey, uh, what are some of your ideas? Pitch me an idea. What do you like long? What do you like short? And unlike when you're first doing this, um, you're a lot more up the curve, understanding your companies. Uh, you still need to be tight on the numbers. You can't just say, oh, short until I say, let's stop shorting it. Like you, you have to be tight on the numbers, uh, but you can articulate a view and you have something of a track record. And what's more, through your interactions with other buy-siders, which you are sure to have doing this job, uh, they too can kind of comment on your on good trades you've had or pitches, things that you pitched before anybody even knew what was going on and that you were right on. Yeah. Um, they'll probably, if if they're pushed, if you, you know, if their arm gets twisted, they'll probably share something about, you know, a bad trade you had too. But yeah, you know, there's a lot of informational value in those too. Like, did you just say, oh, it's got to be algos and that that's why my trade didn't work or did, you know did you examine like how could i be wrong what am i missing right uh those kinds of things fascinating love it love a great insight um really appreciate your time any before we call the pod any kind of final words of wisdom um and just for people listening you can speak with props head um he is a mentor in the wso mentor program so if you are interested in speaking with him there'll be a link um in the podcast and in the q a we hope uh, to twist his arm to get him to do um, but yeah, <laughs> I was going to say for for this and other types of information helpful on your hedge fund investing career, please sign up for a mentoring session. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, any any other uh, words of wisdom? I, I would say recall it if if you're if you're very early in the journey of deciding whether you want to work in the public markets, uh, pick up a book where they interview hedge fund managers. It could be the Market Wizards book. Uh, there was a great book called Diary of a Very Bad Year, where a Vanity Fair reporter happened to be covering hedge funds and asking, you know, what is it that a hedge fund manager does? And they had these weekly check-ins, except these weekly check-ins were taking place during the global financial crisis. So this was like a blow-by-blow -blow checking what was going on when. And so that was a very exciting read, I thought. And so understanding how different people invest is the right thing to do if you're on the fence about if you should get into investing. If you're further along in that and you're working at a bank or a private equity shop or you're in business school and you're looking about, you know, what should I do next? I think something that's important to do is talk to people who do the job. Maybe you have some friends who do it and just uh, set aside some time because, you know, if they're your friends or, you know, if they're your classmates, they can share something with you and you're not burning anything by doing that as opposed to, you know, you can kind of get out a lot of questions that would have otherwise uh, been asked for the first time with somebody whose time is hard to get a hold of. You yeah. can ask those questions of somebody else first. And, uh, you know, you're never going to have all the answers to all the questions. There's always going to be more questions. In fact, if you don't like asking questions over and over again, uh, the public markets will be very challenging uh, <laughs> because you have to constantly be updating your thinking on things. No, nothing is ever set and done. Right. Um, and then if you're, if you're thinking, suppose you're in the recruiting pipeline and you're wondering uh, kind of how to refine your pitch, uh, there are, uh, you know, should it be the case that we can't meet for a mentoring session? There are some great books. There's one uh, I think called uh, Pitch the Perfect Investment, and it goes through, it's written by a couple of hedge fund managers, and for what they wrote is kind of a primer uh, about a lot of aspects of doing this job. And working out kind of what's important to put in a pitch and what your PM might be looking for. These are things that that book touches on as well. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's kind of maybe for kind of the intermediate, uh, you know, uh, aspiring hedge fund analyst, that would probably be a good read. Yeah. What I would say is get the hedge fund interview course from Wall Street Oasis, but then follow it up, develop your own pitch and then hire a mentor before you actually real, before your real interview. It, you know, it's a great point that you make. Um, Wall Street Oasis, of, of the things that I've gone through on the site, including some of the other courses and some that I took for fun, they've been organized, they've been put together well, and 
I could easily point to what I learned after completing the courses. And so I, I, I can't speak to the- Nice plug, nice plug at the end here. Well, you know, I, I, can't, <laughs> I can't speak- uh, I can't speak to I didn't the force him to do that, I promise. No. <laughs> no, uh, the, just a, on a lark, I did uh, some of the data analytics ones and stuff like that, as I do think that there is going to be a trend in the, hedge, in the public markets world where there's a convergence between those who understand data analytics and things like that, and who can wed that with traditional fundamental investing. In fact- Do you know, Py- do you know Python? Are you, do you know Python? That was one of the seminar courses I took during business school. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, so, and, and then I also did the WSO Python uh, refresher. But, you know, the, it's not that they ring a bell when it's time to learn something, but I think that the appearance of a Python course on a website that historically has done interview preparation is a very strong signal that it's worth taking the time to do such a course. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you very much. And thanks to you, my listeners at Wall Street Oasis. If you have any suggestions whatsoever, please don't hesitate to send them my way, patrick at wallstreetoasis.com. Until next time.